Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Dental Up Podcast, brought to you by Keating Dental Arts, a full-service, award-winning dental laboratory. Each week, you'll learn tips and techniques from real-world dentists, bringing you in-depth interviews, motivating stories, current events, and sports. Here's your special host, the general manager of Keating Dental Arts, Bob Brandon. Hey everyone, Bob Brandon here. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Dental Up Podcast. Our guest this week completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Iowa and then went on to begin his dental career at Midwestern University College of Dental Medicine in Arizona. He then completed a maxillofacial prosthetics and oral oncology fellowship at the prestigious MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. Currently practicing full mouth rehabilitative dentistry in Fayetteville, Arkansas, please welcome our guest today, Dr. Naif Sonata. How are you, Dr. Sonata? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's great to have you on the Dental Up podcast, and I know you're a busy man, so let's get right down to it. Why did you get into dentistry, and at what point did you think, I want to be a dentist? Man, if I, people ask me that all the time, um, mainly like dental students, kind of what, what was your motivation, and it, it really wasn't like a particular moment that made me think, this is when I want to be a dentist. But kind of like we were just talking about a little off the air there, my um, older brother is a uh, prosthodontist and my older sister is a pediatric dentist. Um, And when I first started college, I was thinking, you know, I wanted to go into medicine and healthcare and then was slowly getting persuaded by my siblings to look into dentistry. Um, And when I shadowed my brother, that's sort of all I knew was prosthodontics and then got into dentistry and kind of got exposed to all these different fields and was like, oh, wow, there's so much more to dentistry than just pros. But over time, it kind of slowly um, tailored into that. But going back in in high school and in in college, I started shadowing some physicians and then realized while they are making differences and they are kind of, you know, practicing healthcare, it's just the model wasn't something that I really wanted to follow in the sense that they really just sat in their rooms and not to discount our physician colleagues, but they really kind of just sat in their rooms and the nurses and the, and the physician assistants kind of took care of everything. And then they didn't really have much hands on with patients. And so that's kind of where I started looking for something where I could actually have way more interaction with patients than, um, you know, the typical general medicine model. Definitely. Did, did you make these sorts of observations and discoveries while you were in college or was this younger? Um, it was definitely in college. Um, it was between that and partying and getting like a 2.0 GPA. But yeah, it was, it oh, was come on. definitely in college when I, started, when I started doing that. No, I'll be honest with you. My GPA was garbage in college. It was really my, my DAT that got me in. Um, but um, it, it was a slow process, and I don't think I was mature enough in high school to be able to make those decisions. And I know some people, um, like in my class and in my dental class, too, that were way more astute in terms of shadowing and kind of had their head on straight. But it really wasn't until my third or fourth year of college that I really had to kind of buckle down and and be serious about getting into dental school. Um, I ended up doing a master's in public health for two years after dental school. Um, And that's kind of helped that helped me a lot in terms of kind of narrowing my focus down um, and then just kind of getting into school too. So where, um, where did you ultimately choose to attend dental school? And then was your MPH, was that at the same, at the same institution or was that at a, um, a different location? No. So I went to, uh, my my undergraduate, um, college training was at the university of Iowa, go Hawks. Um, and I did, yeah. And I did uh, my MPH there as well. Um, and I did my dental school at the, the best dental school in the world. Um, you're probably familiar with it. It's called Midwestern University in Arizona. Woo, woo. Um, but, but yeah, no, I actually, when I was applying to dental schools, I just kind of looked at the map. This is really embarrassing. It's not even scientific at all. But I kind of looked at the map and looked at some latitudes. And I was like, you know what? Anything south of this, I'm okay with because I'd lived in Iowa at the time for 10 plus years, and I just had it with the winters. And so I was like, you know what, I'm moving south for dental school. And then just happened to to interview at Midwestern and fell in love with it. 
I, um, and then the, you know, kind of the rest is history from there. I understand that completely. I used to live in Boston, and it it snowed like oh, three God. three feet on on April Fool's Day one year, and I was like, man, I, I got to move south. No. <laughs> I got to move no, south. That, so okay, I no, completely understand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, so tell me a little bit a little bit about your dental school experience. Um, how big was the class? Was it was it all on site? Did you get to do any um, fun off location rotations, or um, did we, you do any? So dental school, dental school. I think for me was a little bit different, and for our class was a little bit different than the the average dental student around the country. Um, the dental landscape is obviously changing now, and um, I, I feel I say that because I've been to. I did most of my training. I never trained in one area for more than one program. So I went to from Arizona to New York to Maryland to Texas. So I feel like I got a, a good, healthy view from a bunch of different dental schools. But I think what was different about our dental school um, was that one, it was run by a bunch of general dentists, and there really wasn't a specialist mentality um, as it is at a lot of other dental schools, where the dental schools are kind of run by the specialists and the deans are specialists, and then they kind of look out for the specialty program. So having said that, the dental students do get a lot of experience in their undergrad training than most other dental programs, which is really cool, but also kind of scary knowing what I was doing then. I was like, oh man, I was doing stuff that I had no idea what I was doing or should have been doing. But having said that, you know, it gives you perspective to what your comfort levels are because you will always have faculty there kind of um, watching over you. Sure. Um, so we were doing, I mean, a lot of the dental, dental schools at the, t at the time, you know, it, it, things have changed a lot in the last, since, since I've graduated. And, um, when I was in dental school, um, CEREC and E4D were kind of like in the heat of competing for, sure. you know, I, the, I remember, the yeah. single tooth, same day, same day dentistry kind of stuff. And at our school, it just happened to be team E4D. Um, and it was kind of like a, a battle to get dental students to adopt the technology, which is weird because now I've heard that um, at the school that for every, for every five impressions, one of them has to be a conventional impression or something along those lines. For every like 10 impressions that you make, one or two of them have to be conventional impressions, which is like the opposite of when I was there. It was like forcing people to get digital impressions. Yep. But now they're almost like forcing people to learn the conventional way, you know? Well, you, you need to understand both, you know, both methods and, and the skill set in order to become a successful clinician because we have we have many doctors that you know have a digital impressioning system but there's just certain teeth certain patients that you just you can't scan accurately and the the, the tried and true method of of margin isolation and physical impression you know we we get those cases every month from our from our digital customers yeah no no 100 percent. i mean and you know as a prosthodontist that's that's kind of how they teach you, you know, they, they, to, to learn the analog ways. Because if, if we face it, all the technology that we have is based on analog techniques. Sure. And so digital, all it is, is just kind of changing the medium. It's not changing the foundation or the principles. So you do have to know the principles to begin with. Mm -hmm. But having said that, the office I'm in right now, is we're all completely digital with our entire workflow. So Excellent. Um, you don't need to hang on to the old stuff to, to move forward. So tell me, tell me about your your office and your your decision to go digital. Which um, which system you went with, and and sort of the the pros and cons of of that decision. Now that you're, you know, past okay. that point. Sure. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, so I did um, my dental school training, and then I did a GPR, and then after my GPR, I did uh, prosthodontic training at University of Maryland, and then I did a maxillofacial cancer fellowship at um, MD Anderson in Houston. So um, that's a really niche kind of care level that, that I kind of put myself into, but I just happened to fall into a practice in Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, Ozark Prosthodontics, and we are a prosthodontic office. We have our own lab in-house. There's three prosthodontists here, and we have two master ceramists in-house. So we have an oral design master ceramist, and then another master ceramist um, who manages all our fixed cases. 
So we don't do any removable. Everything we do is fixed and we manage all of our own cases in-house. So having said that, you can imagine the word prosthodontist is kind of synonymous with high overhead and having your own lab in-house is also high overhead. Yes, it is. So you really have to be really, really, really efficient, right? I mean, any any business person will always tell you having your own lab is not a good, is not a smart business move, right? But as a prosthodontist and as a dentist in general, we are always wanting to be in control of our every aspect of what we do. And it's just nice to have that aspect within, you know, your office. But that means that the reason I bring that up is because having said all that, you really have to be insanely efficient with your workflows and with everything else. The way that this office sees it is that there's no other way to be masterly efficient aside from utilizing digital workflows. Absolutely. And so we are digital. Yeah, yeah. So we are digital from <clears throat> acquisition to the CAD to the CAM to milling to printing to everything. So we're we've digitized the entire process. So tell me a little bit about the components of your digital system. Which uh, acquisition unit did you uh, did you guys purchase, and which which milling and printing systems are you currently using? Okay, so um, what we do um, is all, all we do in the office is, is um, only full arch or full mouth um, implant rehabilitation or complex crown and bridge rehabilitation. So um, we basically only do full mouth. So listen to my recommendations having said that, but knowing that what we do is full mouth. It's not, it won't work for everybody, but for what we do, it just works perfectly. So in terms of acquisition, we use the TRIO 3 shape for a scanner. We have two scanners here. Um, we typically, when a patient comes in, we'll get preliminary scans with our TRIOs. Um, for radiographs and CTs, we have a Prexion <clears throat> um, CT scanner. But then we also use the Zircon's on Face Hunter workflow, um, where the patient comes in and gets a digital face bow. We have scans of their teeth. They get a digital face bow and a scan of their face. And then their face gets merged in with their digital scans. So if you want to move the incisal edge or if you want to move the occlusal plane or if you want to move an entire arch, you can kind of see exactly where it would fit within their face digitally before you do anything versus having to make wax rims, mount and remount and check cants and check midlines, et cetera. So we've, we've gotten the Zircon Zon um, workflow from the face hunter to the scanning. Um, we also have a Zircon Zon M1 mill and a Zircon Zon M4 mill. Our M1 mill is basically a, just a digital mill. It mills out um, our zirconia for us. It's a dry mill. And then we have an M4 where we mill out um, our models. We mill um, surgical guides if we need to, but most of all, we mill our temporaries out of out of PMMA pucks. So the M4 um, is, and then, is the M4 is basically for your resin-based products. That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. currently we're using it for for wet um, milling. But mm -hmm. if we would have been recording this in two weeks, we're looking at getting our carbon printer finally, which is super exciting. We have one. So I think that's. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I know. And we're so soon, I need to talk to you be... off the air about, about Ab uh, you know, like troubles we'll and tribulations. Yes, we'll do. <laughs> so it's super, super, super exciting. But um, I, I think, and I'm sure you agree, I think the future right now, CNC and milling is kind of where it's at um, in terms of accuracy. But I think the future is exactly what you guys are doing in your lab with the carbon and with additive versus subtractive techniques it oh, just sure. makes more sense so much faster and the more yeah it's so much faster it it makes more sense in terms of production um but more moreover i think it's just the fact that the all the industries are kind of heading that direction boeing investing so much into there and and you know all these different companies investing into the to the production lines that it's just going to make our materials so much better. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've only owned the carbon for, well, less than a year, and we've already seen uh, significant advances in the materials that they're offering us. And, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very excited what we're going to be able to offer our customers. I mean, you're doing it all oh, on for sure. site. But, yeah, the, the, the products are really, right now, I think th there is a limit on them, but it's, it's going to have limitless applications for us in the very near future. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, I mean, 
The other cool part that excites me about this stuff is that it's, for example, I, I do a lot of maxillofacial uh, prosthetics. And so if a patient is missing anything from the head and neck, I, I make their replacements. And right now I'm doing it all analog. So if a patient's missing a nose, I have to actually like make them a silicone nose with my hands. But with this carbon printer, you can print silicone. Yeah. You can print all sorts of different materials and make it realistic and make it efficient and make it productive. And that's just so cool. Yeah, the 3D bioprinting is just, it's unbelievable what, what can be accomplished these days. And I know we have so many scientists and universities and companies investing in this technology that it's, yeah, it's it, it will it will definitely you know, improve the final result, but also make things easier on, on, on yourself and hopefully on your patients too, on, um, yeah. you know, getting these replacement oh, parts. Yeah. So are you guys printing your own models now or printing your own uh, temporaries now too, or are you sticking mostly to, to mill? We, uh, we are currently milling, uh, provisionals, but, um, the, the, the printed temporaries, the printed essentially like wax ups, that's coming on board very soon here for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just like you said, like a year ago, half of the stuff that there that is out there was not out there before, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I really think we're living like the golden era of, of dentistry. And I say that because, um, you know, I was talking to the same Oklahoma people about it. And Dr. Schillenberg, who's like sure. one of the godfathers of prosthodontic principles, was from Oklahoma. And, you know, um, I talked to a dentist about this um, and he was saying, you know, when I went to school, he's an older dentist kind of nearing retirement. And he was saying that when I went to school, Schillenberg was kind of representing the golden era of, of prosthodontics. We're seeing all these new principles and studies are coming out about resistance and retention form and da, da, da. But most recently kind of being on social media and on Instagram, he felt like this reinvigoration of seeing new dentists and kind of being revitalized into his career and buying these new, he bought new scanners and bought new printers and kind of just felt like this new reinvigoration with career and was like, man, I almost like feel sad that I'm going to have to retire soon. Um, and I think that's because we're in the golden era right now. I mean, like, just like we talked about five years ago, the digital scene was completely different than what it is now. Oh, definitely. Let alone even six months ago. Yep. And I'm sure you're seeing that on your zirconia side for the the M1 mill, uh, the the materials that are available now. You know, with zircons on and and other manufacturers. I mean, th those materials are just they're evolving every month. Oh. It's fantastic. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I, I think that the people that and I always tell people whenever I go for for any lecture events, I always tell them that wherever you are, if you haven't visited your local lab or if you haven't visited the lab that you send your stuff to then you're really missing out because the people that are on the forefront of all this stuff are not the dentist. It's people like you because you guys are the ones who are, whether you like it or not, beta testing. You're the ones who are <laughs> making our lives easier. And all we do is send it out and get something back. But it's you guys that are kind of having to, to be behind the scenes making it all work. Yeah. And when new stuff comes out, you're, you're the first to be exposed to it. Yep, and and we've we've learned we've been bitten by a couple of of purchases and systems, but uh, we've learned right. you know what works for you know our own internal workflow and and for our customers, and we try to we try to make our purchasing decisions obviously as any company would we try to make our purchasing purchasing decisions in line with you know our customer expectations and desires. Um, sure, sure. Well, and the, but that kind of speaks to the kind of lab that you guys are. You have to be ahead of the bell curve in order to be, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fine balance from being at the bleeding edge versus the leading edge. And I think that once you find that sweet spot of adopting new technology, that's when your, your, your business or your practice or your lab can really take off. Sure. You know, absolutely. Um, and, go ahead. Did, did your, did your lab technicians on site, did, did they provide input into you and your, your um, partners in the office um, did they so um, the how the office started was um, the owner right now uh, dr. McNeil has been here since 1993 I think or 94 he's been here for a long time and then kind of slowly grew um, this office to what it is today and um, the lab techs that we have definitely give their input 
um, but it, here's how it kind of runs. It's, it's not so much of a lab management. We have ceramists and two ceramists that get 100% creative freedom into what um, they provide for us. And so one of them is Luke Kasagawa, who's a oral design member. And if you're not familiar with oral design, it's kind of, for the listeners, it's, it's a um, kind of like an exclusive club it's of... Top of um, the line, yeah. <laughs> top, Yeah, top of the line um, ceramists. And it's very fortunate to have this guy in here with us. But having said that, they're artists. And... Um, what you and I would be happy to deliver in 10 days of the week, um, he would kind of take it back nine times out of 10, yeah. right? So yeah. um, you're very fortunate to have people like that in your office to work with them, but you also have to um, be cautious of um, over creativity, if that makes sense. Um, so th the reason I say that is we sort of, how how our office works is, Let's say we're doing a um, failing dentition and we're converting them into a complete implant rehabilitation. Let's say six or eight implants on the top or even four implants, whatever. Um, typically, we'll get them through their beginning scans. We'll get scans, we'll get records, we'll get pictures, everything else that we need um, and then convert them. I'll do the surgery and they'll plan upstairs, they'll plan the prostheses and I'll essentially get them to the temporary phase. Once I'm that beginning part from the begin from the beginning appointment to the temporary phase. I have as much control as possible in those phases, and I'll tell my patients I'm getting you to from zero to seventy five percent, and that remaining twenty five percent is in the hands of the ceramist. In the sense that the prototypes that I will send you up to them with is going to be a prototype that I would feel comfortable cementing or delivering permanently but they're gonna get the artistic freedom to take you from that 75% to 100%. And so that's kind of the, the most input that they get is, is in those final stages of really dialing it in and making ceramics just kind of pop and making them um, lifelike. So um, in that sense, that's kind of the uh, control that they get and they love having that freedom, but it's also a balance. Absolutely. So, um, Walk me through a little bit um, when you're doing your your pre-op scans and and your comb beam and and how is the integration and the file transfer how is how is that meshing and then the execution for the surgical guides how how are those steps um, you know time wise and and file integration awesome. if there's any conversions okay and which software are you using right. for that so we use um, two main softwares, really, two or three main softwares. So <clears throat> again, let's use that same scenario of somebody's coming in with a failing dentition and their final treatment plan is to have, um, let's say, six implants on the maxillary and six implants on the bottom. What we would do is get their original scans from a Trios or from a 3Shape and then put them in a master folder of all the STL scans. So once they're done, they're converted into STL scans and put into a folder. We have some dental students that work with us. They're pre-dental students. One of them starting dental school next um, year, but they essentially help us with all these conversion process. Because if anybody's tried to plan their own cases digitally, they know that one of the hardest things isn't so much, well, planning is hard, but one of the hardest things is just going through the motions of clicking file, open file, mm -hmm. find this file, move mm -hmm. it into that folder. And so what we've done is we've had, we have these dental students who work with us, and also we have lab staff that do this, but a lot of times the dental students will go through those motions and kind of create the files and the workflows for us. So once they have the scans and their STLs are put, or their initial scans are put into a folder, we'll open up Blue Sky Bio, which is a free software from uh, Blue Sky Plan, Plan. For free software mm -hmm. from Blue Sky Bio. And they will import the CT scan from our CT machine. And then they'll also merge that CT scan with the STL of the patient. And so now we have a record of their intraoral mouth with a record of their CT scan and they will start the planning based on my prescriptions. They'll just kind of put in arbitrary implants into kind of semi-good locations. But like I said, that's kind of one of the hardest parts is just finding the file and the click and up uploading it. So by the time that I get to that file, I have an open Blue Sky Plan file that has my CT in, 
my, my intraoral scans merged, and I have a rough placement of however many implants I've put into my prescription. And then all I do at that point <clears throat> is take each implant, tweak it in 360 degrees and move it into the right location, and we put that case on hold. At that point, we take that case, put it into Zircon Zon, and we start our planning, or we start our um, wax-ups. And so our wax-ups are based first based on the implant location, potentially, but more, more, off, more, more often based on my prescription, on, on how the teeth should be prosthetically. Finally, we'll tweak the implant location in Blue Sky and merge our wax up into that whole folder. So at the end of the planning, we have a CT scan merged with intraoral data, merged with a wax up, and merged with the implant location all in one. And the wax and so up. so that way, whenever... You, the, and the wax up, yep, the, merged merged into the implant. The wax up you're referring to that is that is a purely digital wax up at this point in time. Is that a hundred percent? Yes, it's yeah. a digitally. It's a, yeah, I call it a wax up, but we should call it more a proposal than a prototype. Sure. Um, so the the, dig, the digital proposal is merged with the intraoral scan, and the implants ideally are coming out of good locations into the proposal. And in terms of blue sky plan and. Uh, implant compatibility or using Blue Sky uh, implants or using another manufacturer? No, I use Nobel BioCare for virtually all my implant placements. Um, so in the Blue Sky plan software, you're able to put um, different manufacturers sure. in there. So I just use their Nobel mm -hmm. um, com compatible ones. And really, as long as it's within the same dimensions relatively, as long as the height of the platform is the right length, it should be, it should work out um, fine. So at that point, once we're at that stage and we have all those, then we'll generate a guide and then we'll either print the guide or mill the guide. But mostly we're printing our guides on a Juul printer. Um, and lately we've been kind of doing 50-50, either milling the guides on our Zircons on or, or printing them. And then they're, they're ready for me that day. So what I'll have um, the day of surgery, I'll have a printed model of their pre-op scan, and that's mounted. I'll have a printed model of my diagnostic proposal or my wax up, but it's all been done digitally, and that's also mounted. And then I'll also have a surgical guide, and I'll have a temporary shell ready to go for that day of surgery. That's fantastic. Is, is there any any issues or, or problems you've encountered on surgical guide construction um, using the, the Nobel implants, or has, has it been seamless? Are you incorporating metal drill stops into the guides? Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good question. That's something that we're actually we're constantly changing our workflows on. Okay. And the reason I say that is, um, so the, the typical workflow for guided surgery with Nobel is to have a sleeve within the resin. And so it's a metal sleeve that goes into the resin of the guide, and that way, <clears throat> whenever you're driving your sleeve or whenever you're driving your burrs into your osteotomy, you're not driving acrylic or toxic resin into the osteotomy. Sure. Um, well, more and more research is showing that actually PMMA is not going to cause that much harm into the osteotomy. And then by the time you're putting, in, putting the implant in, it's not a... Let me, let me put it this way. When I was doing my training for cancer fellowships, head and neck surgeons would laugh at us. Um, when we were talking about um, having a sterile environment in the mouth, They're like, dude, the mouth is the butthole of the body. Like, it's <laughs> there's no, nothing sterile about it. And we would have neurosurgeons putting in, opening the skull and putting literally acrylic templates to kind of close up the skull and pouring PMMA onto the brain. So. We we which it's a good thing, but we kind of take ourselves a little bit too seriously as dentists sometimes. Um, <laughs> but having said that, we've changed our protocol lately to have our surgical guides not have any um, metal sleeves in them. Okay. And so we, whenever we mill our surgical guides, we mill them just with a with a um, round circle, and that inner diameter of that round circle is the same as the inner diameter of the metal sleeve. That should be in there. Okay, Makes and sense. that way, when you put the key into the into the guide, it just kind of guides through, and it's still protecting um, the the body from 
the harmless acrylic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two extra so everyone can sleep better at night. Yes, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so what what is um, the general, um, I guess, time to complete one of these cases? Um, I know it's obviously you know patient dependent on a lot of them, but um, from treatment plan acceptance to delivery of of new teeth and and the the final prosthesis i'm i'm envisioning it's a it's a screw retained uh monolithic zirconia yeah so <clears throat> it's a screw uh, a, i'll preface by saying that um probably not 90 95 percent of what we do here at the office is zirconia just because that's kind of what we've tailored our work workflows into whether people like it to admit it or not you kind of do what is most efficient for you, Absolutely. as long as it's within the patient's best interest. But having said that, most of our stuff that we do is high-end dentistry. And so if we're doing full arches, um, I'll plan as many implants as I need to plan. And so um, typically it'll be a six to eight implant rehabilitation on either arch, and it'll be a cutback, a digitally cutback zirconia restoration, where Luke and Kite, our ceramists, are adding um, facial veneers of, sure. of um, belt-bathic porcelain to it. Mm -hmm. Do they um, primarily from, layer the, the anteriors or bicuspids forward, or do they do the entire... Do you're going to laugh, especially because you're a lab. They do the entire arch. Yeah. Man. Well, I can yeah. imagine. I, I mean, tell yeah. them, like, dude, yeah. just just do just do the front six. I don't care, but you know, up to to them, it 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 matters. I mean, they're also staining the linguals. They're staining yeah. like interproximal stuff that no one else would see but them. But that's just kind of their modus of operation. It's their art, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, you know, it's their art, and so you kind of have to approach that delicately. By you don't want to discount somebody's art and kind of not make them feel valued, but at the same time, you want going home like, dude, let's just be done. Here. Yeah, um, you know. But um, they're, I mean, they're, they're truly one of the best in, in the world at what they do. And so um, typically our cases take um, around 12 months to complete. And so that's kind of the hardest thing about practicing in this workflow. Um, and it's not so much because, um, you know, in this day and age, people are looking for the immediate, for the quick. And in dentistry, that translates to immediate loading, that translates to all on four, and there's nothing wrong with those protocols. They're awesome protocols, and they work great, and the literature is there to support it. But with the type of dentistry that we're doing, um, I immediate load frequently, but most or more often than not, we are doing staged extractions, sure. where we keep teeth during the transitional phase and then convert provisionals into implants. And what most people don't realize is that the biggest change that people get isn't usually from the temporary to the final. The biggest change that people get is that appointment number one, is that that surgery appointment. So where they go from their original teeth to their new temps. And if you're doing this kind of full arch dentistry, I would challenge you to kind of go back and consider the patients that you've done. And gauge their reaction from the time that they first went from their original non-restorable dentition to the first time that they got temps. Gauge that reaction versus the reaction they went from their temps to their finals. And I'm willing to bet that the, there's been more often than not where some people might even ask for their temps back because they've gotten used to the bite, they've gotten used to the look, or something just feels off with this final. And so... The reason I say that is because whether you're doing a staged approach or whether you're doing a, <clears throat> an immediate loading approach, the biggest change for them is that first temporary or is that first transformation. And so however long you take in those temporaries, it doesn't really, it's not really a marketing practice builder for the patient, right? It's more so at, at getting them out of your office and, and a practice management kind of thing. Sure. And so yeah. most of the time for us, we're doing stuff staged, it gives us chances to go through multiple prototypes if we need to, and it gives our ceramist kind of a little bit more freedom with having the ability to move teeth at different stages when they need to. Definitely. So, so after the last tooth is extracted, the last implant is healed, and you're on the last, um, your last stage provisional, uh, do you then rescan 
the, the patient's mouth, and is that your blueprint then for your zirconia prosthesis? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's awesome perspective, yes. And so <clears throat> that is where we talked about earlier where now we're at that 75% or that 80%, and that's where the, the ceramics upstairs kind of can start to shine. So at that stage, once they are in that final prototype or close to the final prototype, I will take them through Zircon's on Face Hunter, and they will get scanned. First, they'll get scanned intraorally on their temps, um, for occlusion, so we'll get the temps in occlusion. We'll also get a relationship of the implants in that same occlusion. And then we'll take them into Zircons on Face Hunter and scan their um, face in relationship to those temps. And at that point, they have the final ability to really move teeth, change midlines, change cants if needed, based on the location of their face and based on their new smile. Because lots of times you'll have a patient in the beginning come in and animate for you and give you a smile. And it's rarely ever the same smile that you get when you finally <laughs> deliver and they're happy, right? Absolutely. And so I always will try to face Hunter again because that's going to be their new smile. I can't tell you how many, quote, low, moderate smile lines have turned into high smile lines by the time treatment is done. Yep, you know? absolutely. It's, it's hard to gauge where their, their, their muscle position is going to take you know, take their lip line once you, you know, once they see teeth in their own mouth again. And it's like, exactly. Oh. And yeah. because they've lived their life so guarded for so exactly. long. Exactly. Yep. 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 Well, Dr. Sonata, I, I, I think that we could turn this into probably three or four different episodes. There's so much information and content. Oh, easily. And I really, I, I, <laughs> I thank you. I thank you for, for your time. Um, but I would like to have a follow up with you. Um, maybe oh, it's, sure. you know, maybe we'll it's two months or, or three months and we can bring in some of, some of the additional topics that you are doing in your office that we were unable to, to hit on today, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I would love that. So what I'd like to do though, just for like the remaining couple of minutes, I'd, I'd like to, um, maybe if you could just, give uh, so the question is going to be what advice can you give some of our newer dentists that are just starting out today you know there's there's so much um advice i could give and typically i i bet the the first gut reaction is something along with student loans and uh, just because that's that's a sexy topic right that's what people want to hear how do i get rid of these loans yep. and i i would just say I'm not going to give you advice about the loans because there's people out there that are way smarter than you and me that are good with money and utilize those people. Okay. The reason I say that is dentists love to be the dentist, the hygienist, the front desk, the janitor, the receptionist. Dentists love to kind of do everything. And at some point in your career, you realize that delegating to the appropriate people it's probably one of the smartest moves or career decisions or business acumen that you will learn will be one of the most valuable things for you because the more you can spend doing dentistry, the more productive you'll be. And so take that perspective in financial planning too. And so don't be hesitant to hire somebody that is good with financial planning or find somebody that will manage your money or find somebody that will manage your debt. That's my spiel about financial planning, but I think more so don't let it weigh over you in the sense that appreciate where you are at all times and kind of realize that right now, just like we talked about, we're in the golden age of dentistry. And I remember graduating dental school and feeling so overwhelmed with how much student debt I was getting into people saying that jobs are hard to find, da, da, da. But I really wish that the message was more drilled into us that, guys, you are literally living through a renaissance of dentistry. Things are changing in front of our eyes. What I've taught in my digital courses a year ago is completely stone age now. Things are just changing at a rapid pace, and that is probably the most exciting thing about the career that you're in. So true. Because if you compare it to finance or if you compare it to accounting or anatomy that's not yeah, changing very but you're in a career that's constantly changing and you can reinvent yourself you can reinvent your career and it will it, it will be a rewarding career regardless if you're in something that, that that is that fulfilling to so many people 
Well, that is excellent advice. Again, Dr. Snell, I appreciate your time. Uh, Thank you so much for enlightening our Dental Up listeners. And I look forward to speaking with you again in a continuation uh, episode in the very near future. Awesome. I would love that. Thanks again for having me. That's been really fun. Thanks for joining us on the Dental Up podcast show this week. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or search the Dental Up podcast on iTunes for our weekly feed. Don't forget to visit KeatingDentalArts.com slash promo for exclusive offers. Keating Dental Arts is a full-service dental laboratory, and we're nationwide. We'd love for you to send us a case so we can show you the Keating difference. If you dig what you heard, please leave a review on iTunes, and we'll be back next week.